Hello and welcome. This podcast episode is focusing on cybersecurity for charities and not-for-profits. Today we have some panellists in. We've got Glenn Hymers, who's previous charity CISO and now Head of Data Privacy and Compliance at the Cabinet Office. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Chris. Thanks for having me. No problems. And then we've got Michaela Leerborg, who's the former Head of Information and Governance and Security at Marie Curie and who's now a freelance CISO. Hello, Michaela. Hello. Thanks so much for having me today. And last but not least, we have Jeff Maynard, who's created the world's first online backup service and an expert on business continuity and who's Business IT Entrepreneur of the Year 2000. Hello, Jeff. Oh, hello, Chris, and thanks for inviting me as well. No problems. So we're kicking off today. Let's start off with the questions. Um, why are charities at risk from cyber attacks? And I'll probably throw this one straight out to Glenn. Um, I suppose it... Their, their attack surface is a unique one uh, in as much as they collect a lot of personal data around their supporters. They collect a lot of personal data around the people that they represent and help. Um, and incumbent in all of that data is everything from normal PII or personal identifiable information as we would know it, right through to banking information. And it's a large repository of it. Now, combine that with potentially being seen as easy targets because there's not a lot of money uh, sloshing around in the charitable sector, in the third sector, to, to protect the, the charity from nefarious actors outside. And there's also a view from, or potential view from the top in some charities that cybersecurity is something that's a nice to have rather than a, we should have, because by diverting funding from its output and its goal to support whatever the charitable organization supporting be it from young people through to cancer through to homelessness um they're leaving themselves they're diverting funds from elsewhere to to, to not do that primary goal so there's a view that that every dollar or every pound spent on other things is not money spent on what they're trying to deliver as their ultimate output so there's a perceived view that they are a weaker organization from a defensive perspective and it's not necessarily true uh, depending on the size of the charity and the size of the organization uh, but it's there's a that perceived threat or that perceived and and perception is truth in most people's minds isn't it so if they perceive it to be then it is a thing so i guess that's why they're seen as predominantly or why they're at risk from cyber attacks are they at more at risk than anyone else? Uh, arguable, but the impact is ultimately a lot worse than it would be if it wasn't a charity. Yeah, some very valid points there. Jeff or Michaela, any points to add there? Um, well, I was going to answer another question later, Chris, about um, have I seen any examples of, of charities or not for profit? being attacked and the answer to that unfortunately is yes and I uh, my experience very much supports what Glenn has said that the issue here and, and this is not meant to be pejorative towards um, charities or not-for-profit organizations but they tend to have relatively low level IT support they don't have professional IT people um, who can deploy the sorts of tools and barriers and fixes that are needed um, and often the office manager will have IT along the long amongst the long list of things that he has to look after. Um, and what we can try and do is help he or she to understand the risks and take the steps that uh, that will help them overcome them or, or not suffer them in the first place. Yes, yeah, some uh, good points there, Michaela. Um, yeah, I think I would pick up on uh, the point that Glenn said about, you know, are charities actually more at risk than other organisations? And, you know, that's debatable. Uh, I think certainly, again, it depends on the size, but there are some unique factors, I think, about working in charities that don't apply in other organisations, particularly around the volunteers and the dependency on a huge number of volunteers to deliver services who you don't have employment contracts with. So it's very difficult to enforce things in quite the same way you would with employees. Um, and also there's that kind of implicit assumption 
that everyone is there for the good of the cause because you know you all care about the cause that's what you're there to do um but again it's very easy and susceptible to unfortunately people who um will actively you know work with fraud or bribe people so the insider threat aspect it is also there with charities um glenn i think you want to follow up with something i do i do and it was to uh, to follow up on um Michaela's point around uh, volunteers and having worked in a charity which was very volunteer heavy um, and trying to enforce cybersecurity on a such wide ranging in age, let alone in ability in IT space um, to, to, to secure that environment, especially with volunteers uh, who some of them can just about send an email, let alone understand what it is that you're trying to achieve uh, trying to get that message across is key for definite in that space most most definitely I mean some of the points you've you've all raised I, I've come across when dealing with cybercrime victims that small business um, are subject to this as well in that they just don't have it access immediate access in the midst of a response to a cyber incident to the resources and whether that's actually the technology through an outsourced third party company or whether or not that's the, the expertise um, that they can phone up and go help I've clicked on a phishing link the computer's gone a little bit red and it's not doing much what do I do now because it's the initial um, response to a, a cyber incident that really it's all hands to the pump isn't it um, so I think we've we've Moved on, we covered off. Has any of you got any other examples through your lines of work where a charity has been affected? <laughs> Michaela, Back to Glenn. Michaela, go first. I'll let Michaela go first. Go. Oh, um, I was just going to pick on, um, there was an example a few years back um, where, unfortunately, I won't name them, but it's a hospice um, up in the north, and they unfortunately fell victim to a uh, it is a bit of a cyber scan where they combined the phishing element with a follow up phone call and they didn't have the appropriate financial controls in place. So they actually managed to steal half a million pounds of, you know, donated funds from this charity. And I, I think when charities always sort of think, oh, it couldn't possibly happen to us, you know, no one would target us because we're a charity. It's kind of like, they would because you have money. Um, so that was one of the ones that I found particularly useful in helping educate staff. I think yeah. that Michaela's made a, a, a point there that we should emphasize <coughs> again and again. Lots of people, as Michaela said, whether it's charities or not-for-profit or schools, I've come across this, oh, they won't target me, I'm not worth it. Yes, they will. We're all at risk. And we have to get people to understand that it's not the other people who will get done by the bad guys. It's you possibly protect yourself. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with both those points very much. So, um, yeah, have I seen examples of it? Yes, I have. Sometimes on a multiple times in a day. So <laughs> it depends on the charity. I mean, I've worked with charities that are have huge reputations and some of the biggest charities, I've worked with two of the biggest charities, one of the biggest charities in the world and one of the biggest charities in the UK. And we would see it every day. And it isn't just your normal organized crime. One of the charities I've worked with, we were um, we were being probed quite regularly by, I shall just say a state to the, to the east on a regular basis um because of what we did and what we were doing in, in in and around the world so it isn't just that view that they're not going to come after us because we haven't got any money well you have and we collect money and every charity will collect money because money is the lifeblood of the charity they don't the nefarious individuals don't care they will come after you because they have cash if they were nice people they wouldn't be doing what they do for a living in an organized crime capacity um, they'd be doing white hatting rather than black hatting. Um, so <laughs> there we are. Um, but then let's push that on this other way around. I've seen it where I we've been monitoring the dark web and I've seen them talking about giving donations to charities because, hey, that charity does a good job. Let's use some of the money that we've got from the ransomware and give it to a charity. Uh, to which we, we, we did contemplate saying thanks very much for the input, but uh, you know, we, we'd rather not have your donation, but we just left that one alone. 
but um, yeah, it, it does happen. It does happen. It is it is rare. It's not rare to be attacked as a charity or a not for profit or a school. We're seeing that on a day to day basis at the moment. Very interesting points there again, isn't it? So, um, what typical types of cyber attacks have you seen that charities face daily? I think we're throwing this one over to Jeff. Yeah, I think there are two that we need really to focus on phishing and ransomware. Phishing is where the bad guys will create an email that appears to come from your bank, the government, uh, Amazon, uh, someone that, that is respectable. And the email looks pretty much like it's, 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 it is correct. Um, they usually ask you to, to verify something, to, to re-enter your details because they've lost them or your account is, is lapsed or whatever. And you click the link and you appear to go to you know, Barclays website or HMRC website, but in fact, it's a spoof website that the bad guys have created. And you type in whatever they've asked for, name, address, phone number, credit card, whoops, you've, you've lost access to that, uh, that particular item. Uh, and, and we'll come back later to, to how you can prevent this. But the second one is ransomware. A um, lot in the press in the last couple of years as some big organizations, including the NHS, were attacked. And ransomware involves some form of virus or another piece of malware getting into one of your computers, spreading maybe to the others or to your server and encrypting all your data. You then get a message, usually by email, but uh, some cheeky <laughs> criminals will actually telephone um, and say that they've encrypted your data. The only way you can get it back is to pay them a ransom, pay them some money. Um, I wouldn't advise that. Most of the time when you uh, pay the money, you don't get the decryption key. So you're stuck with, with encrypted data, which you can't read and a hole in your bank account. But um, later on in this podcast, we'll look at some of the things you can do to protect yourself from both phishing and ransomware. No, that's a very valid point there. Um, Michaela, have you seen anything in addition to phishing and ransomware? Um, I, I'd agree that those are probably the big two. Um, the other most common aren't actually um, what people would consider to be cyber attacks. They're more around the human error aspect of you know, a well-meaning human being just making a mistake. Um, and in my experience, that was one of the sort of biggest areas. Um, but in terms of cyber, where it's sort of internet connected, um, I'd say that in my mind, experience, again, most of it's been around the phishing, most around spear phishing, around you know, the cyber fraud targeting particular individuals uh, who they may have identified from LinkedIn or whatever. Um, those are definitely the big ones. Um, just trying to think if there's any other major category that I would put up there. I think there's a misconception, a common one, that um, organisations have their budgets, large or small, and they throw it at technical security controls, um, thinking, oh, somebody's going to hack us. And so they focus on closing vulnerabilities. And yes, that is true. But most of the attacks that are successful tend to start with these, the, the phishing emails. So, you know, more emphasis, I think, is needed on budgets in the human factor side of things. Um, but yeah. Some very good points there that sometimes we do plough some of our money into the technology, but we forget about our people and processes. Mm. Glenn? Yeah, I mean, I, I can only echo everything that's been said so far, uh, especially around the people and the human factors aspect, because uh, the firewall might not necessarily stop what it's meant to stop. Therefore, your last line of defence is likely to be the people who are going to click on the emails and therefore they need to be trained, uh, made aware. And educated as to as to their role in things rather than a uh, problem in chair not in computer uh, mm. so picnic but um, I think one of the other things that I used to see quite regularly was spoofing not necessarily mm. what you would consider to be a traditional cyber attack against an organization but taking uh, an organization's identity and using that identity to go out to pretend to be fundraising on their behalf and then siphoning off all those lovely funds to their slush bank account, wherever that may be, um, and therefore depriving the charity of that money in the first instance, um, all the while 
the individual sitting on the other end of that email thinks they're doing something really nice for the world and all they're doing is they're lying in the coffers of some some criminal so spoofing is quite a big one we used to see it quite a lot especially bizarrely in the job market space as well where people would advertise jobs that we had in inverted commas and then charge people funding to to, to take them through the process uh, and getting money that way so there's two areas there which whilst not considered to be traditional threats from a cyber security perspective they're still done in the cyber sphere and on and the online environment so they are things that you need to worry about so things like and we'll come on to how we would combat that in, in a little bit a little bit later on i guess yeah some good points there again um i guess the the charities that would be listening um are probably thinking well what can i do to keep myself safe so should we throw it out there one point from each of you on the best solution you think a charity could do to keep themselves safe um jeff well number one well yeah i following on from what glenn and michaela have said i do i split this in, into technical and staff on the technical side the single most important thing i believe that charities or anyone can do is to subscribe to an offline backup service People think that they've got their stuff on Dropbox or iCloud or Box or um, whatever, and their data is safe. They are not. Cloud services are absolutely not backup. They are synchronized service. And I know iCloud say they back up your, your, your stuff. They actually don't back up your data. They back up your settings of your phone. None of the services, Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, any of them, are backups because they only have one copy. So if your data is somehow corrupted, that corruption is synchronized into the cloud and you've no means of recovering it. If you're using backup and, and a, a robust backup regime will be automatic offsite and multiple copies, yes, the corrupted data will be backed up, but you can go back to last night's, last week's, last month's, last year's version and you can recover. And, and this is the way to get out of a ransomware attack. Um, on the technical side, I've got loads of other points, but the one I would suggest, if you're getting new kit, go for Apple. Apple is safer than Windows, end of discussion. Um, on the staff side, Michaela's absolutely right. It's people who start these things. People click on links, um, usually inadvertently, but they get an email and it, it, it's, there's usually a, a, an essence of, of urgency. You know, we need to get this, your account's been withheld or put on hold or whatever. Supply your your your, your credit, credit credentials right now. And they do it. And the other thing that people do, I know you only asked for one, but you're going to get two here, Chris. The other thing people do is use weak passwords repeatedly. All your passwords must, and I don't say should, I say must be strong, strong password, three random words. For example, um, asparagus, penguin, Everest. And between the first two, put a couple of digits. Between the second and third, put a couple of punctuation marks. Capitalize one or other. And, and this is vital, a different uh, password for every single account and every single user in your system. And if that's difficult to manage, which it is, use a password manager. And there are some password managers available free, which will suit you. They're simple, but they work. Some really, really good points there. In relation to the backup, it is probably your most single important thing. It's it's better than cyber insurance, isn't it? If you've got a good quality golden backup, um, it gets you out of sticky situations, doesn't it? Um, yes, it's, it's interesting that I actually had from Surrey Police, a, a ransomware incident came up yesterday. Um, and the good news was that they had a robust backup regime and, and they didn't lose any significant data. They lost you know, an hour's worth of work that, between opening and getting the attack, but they didn't have to pay the ransom. They didn't have to you know, do whatever um, because they had a, a, a robust automated offsite backup. And the consequences to that, if that company hadn't been in such a privileged position with access to a good backup solution, they would have lost everything through either decryption. They, just, they would have, lost, they would have lost, lost all their data, potentially their business, because without your data today, what sort of business have you got? Um, and even if they paid, would they have got the decryption key? Might. You know. Might not. Likely not. Michaela? Um, your bestest mitigation advice? 
Um, so thinking about what's left. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, seriously, I, I think uh, the credential side it is really key. So splitting mine into technical and people as well. Um, on the technical side, I'd say enabling multi-factor authentication um, absolutely everywhere you possibly can. Um, and encouraging people to realise that they need, to, especially in charities where quite often they use their own devices for work rather than uh, corporately managed ones, um, making sure that their email accounts absolutely do have multi-factor authentication enabled um, because quite often you'll have a password reset um, for a, another account, sends it to that, and if a hacker gains control of your email account, then they potentially have control of everything else and can reset um, other services. So enabling MFA would be my big technical one. Um, on the people side, I think um, one of the most important things we can do for them is help them to understand how to recognise a potential incident and what to do to report it. I think those would be my key things, because if they report it quickly, then you've got a chance of containing. Uh, if they don't, because they're worried about any repercussions, because the culture in the organisation isn't quite right, then uh, that will make things more difficult. Yeah, very good point there. It's just encouraging reporting. Um, Glenn, any more gaps you found? Uh, yeah, tip. I think for me, again, technical in people, but I think on the technical side, for me, it's getting the basics right. And we bang on about this all the time as chief information security officers and IT security managers and whatever, whatever title you have. It's getting the basics right. Um, because from the basics could come housekeeping. Uh, and signing up to or at least aligning to something like Cyber Essentials, at least as a baseline model with a view to using that as your starting blocks, is, mm -hmm. is important and is essential. Um, everywhere I've been, it's the first thing I always do because charities are never, ever going to get to the point where they can go for ISO 27001 certification unless they're a massive charity. And even then, if they're a massive charity, they probably won't because the cost implications that come with that, the people implications that come with that, you've got to have a whole team whose job it is, is just to maintain that ISMS all day long. So your information security management system. And that's really time intensive and people intensive and it's costly. So align expectation management aligned to something like Cyber Essentials with a view to maybe going to Cyber Essentials Plus if you can push the boat out that far um, on a money's perspective. Uh, is, is important because it will help address all of these other technical issues that you should be taking into account, like having good, robust backup, having your multi-factor authentication, because they're all part of that framework. Um, and if you're not there, at least it gives you a path to get to there and have that journey. Now, on the people's front, um, it is all about education, 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 education. I think that's been driven home here. Uh, but what I would say to help back that up is let's not do a certain railway company type fishing exercise. Uh, let's stay away from that, shall we? But at least do ethical fishing. Let people know that you will be carrying out fishing exercises. Don't tell them what it is that they're looking for, as in it's going to come on Tuesday at 11 o'clock, but do let them know that it's coming. And then that way you get to understand whether the, the, the education aspects are actually filtering through. So it's all well and good educating people and saying, as an IT security manager walking away from it, going, there we are, job done, finished. Um, but if they're still clicking on those links and they're not reporting them and doing all of that, then that, that hole is still there and will always be there. And then the other thing to do is to make sure it's timely. One thing that the charitable sector has, which is I, I think is slightly different over any other sector, is there's a rather large footfall of people walking through organisations. They move from organisation to organisation. It's quite a transient, I'm not sure that's the right word, but you get the idea. It's quite a transient environment. People will move from charity to charity to charity, uh, or they'll go out of the sector and then they'll come back into the sector again. So making sure that it's timely and people get it on a regular basis on the education front is key as well. 
Yeah, I think covering off staff turnover might be slightly higher. Mm. Um, but Kayleigh, you've got... Um... Yeah, if we've got time, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things that Glenn said there. Um, so, Cyber Essentials, uh, I think, absolutely does have a place. I think it's a very good uh, baseline for you know, small organisations especially. Um, but I do actually think it misses a couple of what I would consider to be the basics. I know we can debate this for hours. Um, so I actually think the uh, Centre for Internet Security 18 um, critical security controls, it used to be the top 20, um, their first implementation group focusing on what do you actually have? Do you know what you've actually got before you can actually secure it? Um, so I think that aligns very nicely with cyber essentials. So um, I, I agree about the basics. Then just on the fishing front, um, I, I don't know if it's perhaps worth you just explaining for the organisation, sorry, for the listeners who aren't familiar with that particular phishing email you're talking about. Yeah, I can do. Yeah. So um, recently, a train provider. <laughs> Um, I think it was what it was up in the north of England, um, sent an email to all of its employees saying, congratulations, well done. You've done really well over COVID. Therefore, we're all going to give you this pay rise. But you need to click on this link. Um, uh, and then promptly turned around and said, no, that's all rubbish. You're not getting anything. You're not even getting a pay rise. Uh, mm. And it really, really hit the ground flatly and demoralised an awful lot of individuals within an organisation. And it drove home the fact that Yes, phishing is important, but the tone of the messaging within the phishing is equally as important. Don't be that liability who's just going to destroy an entire charity by demoralizing, demoralizing everybody in it by going, you've all done an awesome job and you're going to get this money, but you've got to click on this link to confirm that you are who you say you are. Um, I've done it previously elsewhere. We, we, we did it as a competition. Um, we've yeah. just signed a... So what we did is we just signed a... Um, a sponsorship agreement with a large car dealer uh, and we basically sent around an email saying to celebrate the fact that we've signed this contract with this car dealer we're giving that there's a competition to give away this type of car for a week if anybody wants it um, and this was not uncommon so this was stuff that used to happen quite regularly in the organization i was in and um it, but you had to provide your driving license number to prove that you're over 18 and you had a driving license otherwise what's the point in having the car uh, so yeah we um, <laughs> that was really quite successful in a bad way which kind of highlighted an awful lot that i needed to do while i was there but it it served a purpose but it, what it didn't do was demoralize the entire world uh, as per the, the train company for example yeah you've got to manage uh, cyber security so it doesn't have an impact on morale i think there yeah um i think uh, we'll probably cover off supply chain attacks and how they can affect a charity um to do you want to explain to our listeners what a supply chain attack is? Um, I think, Michaela, you want to answer this one? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, all, I can't think of a single charity probably that doesn't depend on at least one or more suppliers uh, to deliver their services to their beneficiaries. And uh, a lot of charities as well actually uh, are contracted to provide their services to other customers. So this whole sort of chain of supplier, customer, supplier, customer is what we mean by supply chain. And one of the rather useful techniques uh, for cyber criminals is to, if their goal is to perhaps get into this company um, at the top of their chain that they've identified, that's who they want to compromise. They'll look for information about who supplies that company and identify them and say, okay, is their security weaker? Actually, no, that's pretty good. Let's look at another one. And when they find an organization that supplies this other company that's got a chink in its security, that's the one that they'll actually compromise. And then once they get into there, they can then use that access and it depends on the type of relationship. So you might have, for example, um, healthcare charities who might have a connection to the NHS central spine network. And so being able to compromise one of the smaller charities might give them onward access into that 
for example. Um, so thinking about the sort of community of networks, it effectively they're all eventually can be joined up. And one of the big instances recently uh, was um, a product called Kaseya, and they provide software for um, managed service providers. So one of the things we've spoken about is that charities often don't have the in-house skills and resources for IT and cybersecurity. So understandably, they outsource it to one of these providers. So that provider it is then also a link in that supply chain. So when cyber criminals were able to compromise this product, affecting lots of these managed service providers, that then gave onward access to their customers. So this whole thing about supply chains it is a very sort of t- um, current and big concern uh, because of the access it potentially gives cyber criminals. Quite a big risk to any organisation that relies on others to provide them cybersecurity provisions, if any provisions, I guess. Very good uh, definition of that one. Um, I think we're going to f- ask a final question because we've covered off some really good points here. Um, so, how can cyber criminals use a charity's social media channel or the information on those channels in order to carry out a cyber attack? Um, I'll throw this one out to Glenn or Jeff. Realistically, is um, I know most organisations do have to advertise, um, and again, most businesses advertise to bring in profit and revenue, and again, um, charities will bring in advertisements to bring in donations. So how can that be turned against them? Yeah, in in my work with with Surrey and and Sussex Cybercrime Units, I deal with a lot of individuals who've had one or other of their social media accounts breached usually because they have a, a easy to guess password and the uh, username is their email so that's no secret and what happens is that, that the bad guys get hold of your contact information perhaps some um, compromising photographs but they also might get hold of information that can enable them to to pretend to be you and your national insurance number your credit cards whatever and i think the same potential issues are there with with any organization including charities where they post for what they think are very good reasons information which can then be used to uh, to, to steal identities or to to pretend to be something if you put the details of you know one of your suppliers uh, as has just been mentioned the supply chain attack you need to know who is being supplied and by whom so that you can get in the middle and i think often People inadvertently put information on social media that is 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 useful. They think it's hidden because they they only allow uh, you know selected people to view their, their um, posts, but they can be breached. And, and I find this a lot with individuals, and I, I'm guessing it happens as well with uh, with organisations. So true, so true. Glenn, yeah. some closing comments on that one? Yeah. So I think the biggest. The biggest thing people need to be wary of with social media, especially from a charitable perspective, is um, the fact that, as you've already alluded to, they use their social media handles and their social media accounts on Twitter, Instagram, all those types of things to raise revenue, to draw footprint, to get the message out for the organisation. Um, but the biggest the biggest use of that information is potentially through through things like spear phishing so, uh, and the phishing campaigns, because it makes those spear phishing so and, and whaling and all those other types of phishing campaigns that you can do much more targeted if you've got your open source intelligence, which you've gleaned from wherever on the Internet, which is all publicly inf- informed and advertised information. Um, not necessarily. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily know who the CEO of Marie Curie is currently, for example. But all I've got to do is have a look online, have a look on the Internet, and have a look on the social medias. And I'll find that out very, very quickly. Uh, and therefore, I then have that starting block. Or I would then know who the fundraising manager is because they'll tell me who the fundraising manager is. And it's a very, very quick way to see into the soul of an organization through their social media. Very, very quick. All you've got to do is look through it for a couple of days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks, do a bit of open source intelligence gathering on it. uh, And you can glean an awful lot of information about it. And then to tie that onto the other thing, which is the out of office. The last thing anybody should be doing is sharing their out of office with anybody outside of the organization, because as soon as you send that email and they go, oh, they're out of the office. Oh, I now have another avenue to go to because there'll always be someone else to speak to. 
if it's an urgent request. And then you can go to them and go, I've got this really urgent request and I've had the out of office from the CEO. Can you deal with this? Go buy me 500 Amazon cards and post them to this address. Yeah, yeah, you're basically handing it on a plate, aren't you? Exactly. And that's just something people need to be mindful of. Good points. Um, Michaela? Um, yeah, just a, one of my pet peeves actually related to information published online is um, job adverts, uh, particularly for IT. Um, they have a tendency to include lots of information about the technical environment because they're looking for certain skills and experience with technology. But as an attacker, when you look at that, it's like, oh, great, they use that, 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 that. And, and you know, it just shortcuts the whole process uh, from an attacking point of view. So, uh, yeah, if you can sort of sanitize those with HR, uh, that's a tip I'd give. Yeah, that is a very good point. I've done a few ethical hacking courses in my time and quite frequently that's a point of information then you know what operating systems what enterprise contracts they've got it's it's great source well i've got to say thank you to all three of you for your help on this podcast i certainly know our listeners are gaining some really valuable tips from your insightful contributions um so please remember the cyber resilience center for southeast is here to protect your organization against cyber crime and we can provide affordable testing products and training services where needed but um without further ado and unless uh Either three of you want to add something else? I think um, thank you for today's podcast.